Good morning. It's nice to be with you. Uh, we are coming on in January. The, the days are getting longer, slowly but surely. And we're still talking, in a way, about Jesus going to the Jordan River and meeting not only John at the river, but doing something so important to begin his ministry. And today I want to talk to you about the idea of baptism itself and the rules and laws of the church and of society, which have been so pushed and tested, particularly of society, this last week or so, with what happened in Washington, D.C. So please take a moment, if you would, and we'll begin with prayer. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and it will be forever. Amen. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day will tell its tale to another. One night will impart its knowledge to another. Although they have no words, they have no language, their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all the lands, their message to the ends of the earth. In the depth has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. O God, the source of all life, you fill the earth with great beauty. Open our eyes to see your gracious hand in all your works, that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness for the sake of him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of Malachi, from the rising of the sun to its setting. My name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts, and in every place incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations. Thus says the Lord. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 1981, my daughter was born in Sault Ste. Marie. And after my wife and I got the, over the initial shock of bringing her home and our little house became three instead of two, we began to think and prepare for her baptism. Baptism is a, a right of entry, if you will, into the Christian church. Um, years ago, uh, um, Christian denominations gathered together and produced a document in Lima, per Lima, Peru, which basically said it's not magic. We're not doing something magical to push them into heaven. We're doing something of a welcome, to welcome new souls into the Church of Jesus Christ. So we began to plan for that baptism, if you will, that christening it's also called by many people. And we picked three godparents. Now, in this day and age, it doesn't matter how many godparents you pick. You can pick up to 10 or whatever. But we chose three people because that was kind of the old tradition. You chose for a girl, uh, two women and a man, and for a boy, two men and a, wo and a woman. So we chose two women. One was uh, Sister Adeline Ryan, who had been a nurse who uh, had nursed me, I'll put it that way, through my cancer surgeries. Um, she prayed with me pretty much every day. She'd come down from where 
uh, the Grey Nuns, where she was encamped at the hospital in Sault Ste. Marie, to come down and pray with me and talk with me and share with me. Uh, she was not really a nurse, but she nursed me through my cancer by loving and caring for me. The second was Leslie's best friend, Joanne. And she had been with Leslie for my wife for many, many years through school and high school. And she brought uh, a tremendous gift of herself to our family. Now, both of those people were Roman Catholic, and that didn't matter because it says that you should have three godparents who are already baptized. I had to pick a friend of mine to be the male godparent, and I picked a fellow named Mike. Now, Mike was somebody I had known through my years at Trinity College at the University of Toronto. Mike was not baptized, but Mike was probably the most Christian person I knew in many respects. He cared for people around him. He was honest and caring and really a very fine human being. And I picked him because I knew that he would be a good godparent to my daughter. All three of those godparents through the years kept up with my daughter, kept up with her in Christmas time at different times uh, until Sister Adeline died and Joanne died. Uh, Mike still keeps in touch a bit with her and sends us a Christmas card every year. And my daughter is now in her 30s. So we know that godparents are important, but I broke the rules. I broke the rules that said all three or all godparents should be baptized Christians who sponsor another soul into the Christian church. But I believe this, there is no ticket to heaven. There is nothing that we do in our rights within the church that gives us the right to claim we are better than or have a, a gift of going into heaven. Doing God's will in our lives is somehow more important than simply saying words. I knew that I broke the rules. I knew that I was taking a person who didn't necessarily fit to the description of what a godparent should be. But I also knew that he would be a very good godparent. And the years have shown me that he has indeed been someone who has been a good godparent. The rules got broken last week in Washington, D.C. The rules of the United States basically do not allow people to simply attack the Capitol building to destroy things that are very important for people, the symbol of their freedom and their liberty as a democracy. It was a culmination of four years of basically lies that were given by the current president of the United States. There were times that we do need to break rules that we knew need to break laws, but not at the expense of human lives. Six people have died as a result of that rioting, that sedition, that terrible day at the US Capitol building when hundreds of people, if not thousands, broke in and took things that they shouldn't have taken, that did things they shouldn't have done, that paraded through the US Capitol in defiance. They broke the rules but they also endangered the lives of so many people. So when can we break the rules? When can we see that rules serve us, that we don't serve the rules? Well, there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. So if you are in fact following all the rules of the Bible, you might want to take a look at all of those 613 rules because they exist there as a way of saying, God demands this of you. 10 were given to Moses. But 613 ensued of those, well, 603 then ensued. Jesus broke it down to three laws, three rules, three simple rules. He said, if you are doing these rules, then you're doing the will of God. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Well, if you want to be a literalist, it's just two. It says, love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But basically, you got to love yourself before you can even love your neighbor because you got to know what love is, what love means. Love is both a noun and a verb. And you and I have to take time to find out what it is to care, to share, to be. And it doesn't mean you need a huge ego to love yourself. It means you have to be able to respect yourself, to respect and honor who you are in order to respect and honor your neighbors. God, the creator of all, needs our respect and our love. God, who is our neighbor, is found in our neighbor, needs to be respected as an immortal soul because every human being is an immortal soul. Every human being is meant for heaven. 
To love ourselves is a tough one because there's a fine line between egotism and overdoing it, of, of, of becoming hateful of ourselves and being overly egotistical of ourselves. That's a fine line preachers have to find, have to find because we have to have enough strong enough ego to get up and preach to people and say to people, this is what God is saying. But we also have to be humble enough to recognize this is not us. This is God speaking through us. And we are not the object of people's affection. The President of the United States forgot that. He is not God. He is, in fact, a servant of the people of God. University and colleges have what they call an honor system. The honor system is very important. Um, best way I can describe it is to say that we expect you on your honor to do the right thing. So universities say there's an honor code here. Uh, no cheating, uh, no deceiving, uh, no plagiarism, none of those things. I found out a few months ago that the, you know, the uh, United States Military Academy had a scandal that in fact uh, 39 of the cadets at the Military Academy at West Point had cheated on their exams and they were found out. And obviously, many of them were fired. Uh, they were let go. They were expelled from the United States Military Academy because there's no tolerance, in a way, for misusing or abusing your honor. Jim was a friend of mine and uh, my undergraduate years at university. And Jim was uh, a guy who was very friendly with everybody, but he liked to party a lot, too. And in partying, he was not the hardest worker in the world, but he was very smart. And he was so smart that he could get by without even going to classes and yet writing exams on, based on learning the night before and do well. But Jim made one very bad mistake. He wrote a paper that was due for both two classes. One was in history and one was in political science. He wrote the same paper and submitted a copy to each professor. Now, somehow the professors found out that, in fact, Jim had written the same paper for both of them. When he was confronted, he was told that he had plagiarized because he'd actually plagiarized against himself by writing the same paper for two professors. He was expelled. I saw Jim again later years, but Jim's parents were obviously quite torn by the fact that he cheated, that he, in fact, did not honor himself or them or the university by doing such. The honor system depends on us to be honorable people, to respect ourselves, to not just have laws given to us, but God-given rules internalized, to internalize the laws, the rules. Jesus did not require that baptism. Jesus did not require that people have to do this or have to do that. But Jesus did say, if you have loving for your God and your neighbor and yourself, you will always do the right thing. In other words, he's taking it into the internal part of who we are. You and I can live our lives following all the rules. I mean, I follow the rules as far as stopping for stoplights. I pay my taxes every year. Um, I don't run out in the streets and steal or take from other people. I follow the rules. I'm a good citizen. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus isn't talking about following all of the rules. He's saying the rules have to be written on your heart. The honorable thing to do, the honor of being a human being, of submitting yourself to God, to love God, to love your neighbor, to love yourself, are rules written somehow deeper within you. If you do those things, you will always do the right thing. You will always follow rules and laws because you won't want to harm what God has created. You won't want to harm your neighbor who you love as yourself. And you wouldn't harm yourself by abusing yourself with drugs or alcohol or many of those things that people do. It's letting God lead you, letting God into your life and letting him lead you. I watched something the other night which was very telling. The former governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, if you haven't seen it, you should, uh, gave his talk about what happened at the U.S. Capitol building. He basically talks and says some of the things I said uh, last week about servanthood. He talked about the fact that he grew up in Austria, in post-war Austria, where many of the men who were his parents, his father for one, and many of the men on his block 
had all served in Hitler's army. They had been part of the Third Reich. They hated themselves later on for what they had done. But it all began, he said, on Kristallnacht in 1938, when they smashed the windows of Jews, when they declared war, in a sense, on the Jewish people in Germany. And he said that's what happened at the Capitol building in Washington. When they smashed in the windows, they opened up the hate of what was Kristallnacht in Germany. They brought that somehow to the U.S. Capitol. And now they're talking about everything from impeachment to censure to rules of conduct. There are laws, there are rules, and they were breached. But what he said in his little talk, Arnold Schwarzenegger, was the fact that somehow we have to take within us, as people of God, the sense that we are all servants of each other, that we are called to serve, and in all humility, we are called to respect each other. That's loving our neighbor as loving ourself. That's respecting the dignity of every human being. That's respecting the fact that we are all important to God, but we have to learn to listen to each other and not to lie, not to live in lies, but to live in the truth of what it is. Jesus asked more. Do you remember the story of the rich young man? There is that wonderful story of the rich young man who comes to see Jesus and he said, you know, I have followed all the rules in my life. I've been a good person. Now, many of us could say the same thing. Coming before Jesus, we could say, look, I've followed all the rules in life. I've always done the right thing. You know, am I going to find eternal life? And Jesus says to the rich young man, as he would say to you and to me, all you have to do is to give what you think is so important away. He says to the rich young man, give your wealth away and follow me. But he's really saying, if you're bound by something that's holding you back from following God, let it go. Let it go. Let it go and recognize that to love God and to love your neighbor and to love yourself are the most important things a human being can ever do. Those are the rules God sets for us. Those are the rules by which we have to live. And they can't be written down in form. We can't have lawyers interpreting for us what the Supreme Court declaring for us. We have to know that it's written here within us that we will love God. We will recognize in all creation the fact that God has given us a beautiful place to live. Creatures, flora and fauna that are just crucially important to preserve. We will know that if we love our neighbors, we are doing the work of Jesus, the Son. We are doing the work of caring for those around us. And if we care for ourselves, we're doing the work of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit dwells in us. The Spirit is there for us. The Spirit is always saying to us, you are loved. God so loved you, he gave you his only son. So to love God and love our neighbor and love ourselves is that whole Trinitarian idea. It is that fact that God loves us for who we are. And with Jesus, there are no rules required. There is no right that will make us better. There is the sense that if we know Jesus, we will be known by Jesus, and our hearts will tell us always the right thing to do in loving, caring, and sharing the Word of God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, send your Spirit into our hearts. Comfort us in all our affliction. Defend us from all error. Lead us into all truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed Savior, at this hour you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms. Grant that all the people of the earth may look to you and be saved for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Almighty Savior, at midday you called your servant St. Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Fill this world with the radiance of your glory, that all nations, all peoples may come and worship you, for you live and reign forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. And now, as our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.